This episode is sponsored by my online course, Mineral Management Basics. Understand what you own, gain the power to manage your minerals and royalties. Did you first find out that you inherited mineral rights or royalties from a phone call or a letter from a landman or mineral buyer? Do you want to have a better handle on what it is that you own so you aren't caught off guard next time? If you're like most people, you want to learn all you can about being a responsible and informed mineral owner. I'm going to help you cut through all the confusion to not only learn more about your existing mineral rights and royalties, but to also equip you with the tools to find out if you might own other interests that you don't currently know about. In Mineral Management Basics, I'll walk you step by step through the process of finding out exactly what you own and where it is located with high quality videos that aren't too long and examples along the way, you'll be able to locate your mineral and royalty interests on a map, perform your own title search, and identify nearby oil and gas activity. Your interests are depending on you to find them. Go to mineralrightspodcast.com and click on Courses. Again, that's mineralrightspodcast.com and click on the Courses link to learn more. Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Williams. And we're here to help you make the most of your minerals and royalties. And we're going to cover mineral rights news for... May of 2024. Justin, uh, an interesting mix of stories, actually kind of a quiet news uh, month, but we do have some pretty interesting stories in terms of some things happening on the federal front related to minerals and royalties. And of course, we'll talk about the rig count at the end, but what was your take on these uh, stories that we've got this month? Yeah, I think you nailed them at it. It's kind of a quiet news cycle. There is some to talk about, but um, not any major cases aside from our last one here. Uh, that seem to be talked about right now. Yeah, and that could be setting an interesting precedent. We'll get to that here in a second. But before we do that, do you want to dive into this first story? Let's do it. So the title here is U.S. Emergency Oil Reserves Remain at a Near Four-Decade Low Amid Rising Global Tensions. The map the article talks about after releasing substantial supplies in 2022, the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve remains near a four-decade low That leaves the U.S. with less wiggle room to manage oil and gasoline prices as tensions rise in the Middle East. However, as uh, 2022 showed, releasing supplies from the reserve has limited ability to affect the sprawling global energy market. And Matt, you know, these are things we've kind of talked about before, uh, but it's an update as to where we're at. And we were talking before the show that uh, the government said they were going to replenish those supplies at around uh, $70 a barrel. And it looks like they did do some of that, but it's not back up to the four-year-ago average. Yeah, exactly. Before they started to release the oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, it was around uh, just under 600 million barrels at the end of uh, 2021. And that is down from the record high at 726 million barrels between uh, 2009 through early 2011. So. They drained roughly 230 million barrels of oil and sold that to try to keep prices down when we had really high gasoline prices and really high oil prices back in the beginning of 2022. And you know, to your point, Justin, they have started to purchase crude oil. And the reason I picked this story just to give an update on you know, what they said they were going to do relative to where we're at today. And it seems like we still have a ways to go to refill that Strategic Petroleum Reserve because the current levels and the current rate of consumption in the U.S. is about 20 million barrels of oil per day, and we have about 18 days of coverage in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And I think the target has always been at least like 30 days. So in my mind, they have a ways to go to refill the SPR and get it back to where we have a comfortable level of reserves. Now, the thing that's different in the past, you know, 2009 through 2011, that 726 million barrels, that time, that was like right prior to the shale revolution. And so oil production was down significantly compared to where it is today. So I think just new production that we have day day in, day out can meet about half of our current consumption needs. And so, you know, there's an argument to be made that maybe the SPR doesn't need to be at that peak 
700 million barrel level. But you know, it does make sense to me to have at least a 30-day supply, even though we do have continued drilling, continued production of oil. We are the largest producer in the world of oil. You know, it just seems like more of a strategic imperative to get that back up to more conservative levels. So we'll see what happens, but just want to give an update on where we're at. You said it, Matt. Yeah. And I think it's coming up because it's being used as kind of a saber rattle to to say that, well, if this happens, you know, we might be able to control prices. But it's questionable whether that would really help at the end of the day, which is this article talks about. Uh, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see in election year what ends up happening and um, if they're able to replenish in the near future. All right, Matt. So our next one here is about Colorado. Um, the Fed bans a new oil and gas development on a swath of Colorado public lands in the mountains. And Matt, this is in the makes it the Thompson Divide, which stretches from Glenwood Springs to Crested Butte. And it looks like this is a federal ban. So you may still have the private acreage like we were talking about that this doesn't apply to, but would make it difficult for operators to really develop it, period. Exactly. Yeah. The acreage is around 347 square miles of public land, around 220,000 acres. And it just basically blocks new oil and gas development for the next 20 years. So it's not a permanent ban. There's a a term for that. Basically, it's like an administrative removal of that acreage or whatever. But interestingly, most of this area anyway, I would say is not really prospective for oil and gas development. It's a rugged terrain. It's in areas that probably don't even have a lot of sedimentary rock that you go after that contains oil and gas. It's metamorphic. It's these large mountains and things like that. So I think it's a bit of maybe symbolic gesture. That said, there is an area closer to Glenwood Springs that is more on the edge of the Piance Basin, which is a very productive natural gas field. And so I'd say the acreage closer to Glenwood and in areas that maybe are adjacent to existing oil and gas development, where there's a checkerboard of private mineral rights, it could have an impact on those uh, fee minerals. In other words, to your point, Justin, if an operator is not going to be able to form a federal drilling unit to have enough acreage to develop those private minerals, and they're not going to develop the private minerals. So a lot of times you have to pool together the federal minerals with the private minerals in order to develop that acreage. And so in this case, it could have an impact of blocking oil and gas development on those private minerals that are adjacent to the the acreage that's covered by this this administrative ban. So yeah, just something to keep an eye on, I guess, if you do have mineral rights in those areas. And certainly there's the concept of the ability to develop mineral rights and then whether anything would ever happen. And and in this case, if it's not economic to drill for oil and gas anyway, because of where it's located and the nature of the terrain and the ability to get the products out of that area because there's no infrastructure, you know, the likelihood of development have been low anyway. And there's plenty of other areas prospective for natural gas development that don't have these types of issues. So in my mind, it's probably not going to change what would have happened anyway, in terms of, you know, the fact that there probably wouldn't have been natural gas development there anyway. So, you know, interesting to see what the response is from industry groups and from any affected private mineral owners, if they try to pursue a takings claim. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, you said it, Matt. And, you know, it's starting to set up a playbook, which is to ban these federal areas, which theoretically, I suppose, could divert the takings case since they're actually not, you know, doing anything with your private minerals. But the case may end up being that if we see a lawsuit come from something that is worth it, then it may be that, okay, well, the banning of this federal lands affected my private minerals. And that would be an interesting discussion to see kind of play out. But we've seen this happen a few times. So it's starting to look like this might be the way that the conversation is going to be had at least. Yeah, I agree. All right, Matt. So our next one here is basically a case where the EPA prevented a mine from being developed. And then the state of Alaska is suing the EPA because of this. And it was a pebble mine, Matt. And this has been going on since for at least a year. And maybe it's been much longer than that. Yeah, this has been ongoing. And, you know, this was a big deal. This pebble mine is was a proposed copper and gold mine in Alaska. And I remember, you know, seeing even here in the Denver area, people with bumper stickers that said ban the pebble mine. And so there was a lot of 
political debate around this proposed mine. And certainly with this whole electrification push, you know, EVs and all the things, we need to have more copper and more of these minerals. And so that was the thought process behind developing this mine, I think, you know, even at the time, which is, it's, this has been going on for a number of years. In 2023 is when they blocked that mine and within a pr- approximately 300 square miles in Southwest Alaska. And so in response to that, the state of Alaska asked the Supreme Court to reverse the EPA's decision and allow the Pebble Mine and similar projects to proceed. And and so they basically issued the decision under the Clean Water Act because of specifics. And you can read the the article to find out more. But but interestingly, what is happening is because the state um, this this falls under the state's mineral rights that they had received under a 1976 land swap agreement under which the U.S. government received 700,000 acres of land to create Lake Clark National Park and preserve. In exchange, they gave the state federal lands, including the Bristol Bay watershed, which is where the pebble mine would have been located. And the state says that there's no other economically productive activity that could occur there. And so they're pursuing a takings claim under the Fifth Amendment. So this is uh, something that's really interesting because we talked about this in depth in episode 237, which talks about how regulatory takings can threaten private mineral rights. But in this case, the federal government's actions have affected state mineral rights. And so they're suing the government, seeking a a takings uh, claim. And so this one is going to be drawn out for a while. The Supreme Court declined to hear the case. And so we'll see what happens after this. But Pretty interesting situation. You know, we talked about this whole concept from a private mineral owner perspective, and now a state is going through this process. And so, again, it just goes to show the the Fifth Amendment doesn't just apply to private individuals; it also applies to the individual states, which is I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, you said about it. You know, there's really there's the two outcomes: either they'll allow the mine, the mine to go on, or if. Alaska is successful, I should say there's two outcomes. They'll allow the mine to go on or they're looking for compensation under that Fifth Amendment to cover the value of the land that was taken by the EPA's decision or the economic impact of that. And there was a statement mentioned in here that the Pebble Mine alone would provide more than $100 million in annual revenue through state taxes, licensing fees, and royalty payments. And then, of course, you've got the private um, royalties if that might be involved and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's a lot of money at stake for the state of Alaska. So they're trying to, you know, that's really the financial motivation is what's underlying this. And so, yeah, interesting to see what happens if they decide to reverse it. You know, how does that affect EPA authority if it affects the ownership of the mineral rights or the value of the mineral rights? So probably some interesting precedent that would get set in this case. I'm I'm not sure, but it seems like it. So. You said it, Matt. All right. And last but not least, the rig count. So story seems to be the same, Matt. Looks like we are very, very slowly gaining units in the most productive areas and then losing units in some of the more difficult or less productive areas. Yeah, we're down three rigs as of April 26th of 2024. We're at 596 land rigs down from 599 the week prior. And most of the rigs that have been laid down are from New Mexico, Colorado, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Interesting that Louisiana and Pennsylvania are leading the the way there. Pennsylvania is down one rig, Louisiana is down four. And in my mind, that is not surprising at all because those are two natural gas plays, the Haynesville Shale in Louisiana and also the Marcellus in the Appalachia Basin in Pennsylvania. So, you know, we've seen press releases from EQT that have stated that they are curtailing production by around one BCF per day through May at this point because of the low natural gas prices. And so it's not surprising to see in addition to curtailing existing production that they're slowing down the pace of drilling new wells just because it is not economic. They're not going to uh, make their money back in the current gas prices. So as those rig contracts are up, they're starting to lay down those rigs until prices recover. And so I expect to see a continued decline in the rig count in Louisiana and Pennsylvania in particular, they still have a ways to go. I think there are 36 rigs in Louisiana, 21 in Pennsylvania. If gas prices stay where they're at, I expect to see those continue to come down. It's a little bit surprising to see a a rig drop in the Permian and a rig drop in the DJ basin in in Colorado. But, uh, you know, again, 
could just be shuffling around between different companies that have acreage in different basins, you know, taking a rig from there, putting it over here. You know, they have a certain capital budget and they want to develop and hold leases and do all the things. There's a lot of constraints that play into all of it. So, but yeah, pretty consistent story that we're seeing again this month. You said it, Matt. Well, that does it for May's news. Yep. Just like we said, a pretty quiet news cycle this month, but uh, you know, some potentially long lasting and impactful decisions that are going to be made at the federal level. And so we'll interest, it'd be interesting to see what happens on these uh, particular decisions we mentioned and uh, you know whether the U.S. continues to refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve given all the geopolitical stuff going on. So stay tuned for that and we'll talk to you next time. And as always, if you want to submit an article, you can send it to feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com and you can find links to the articles we talked about today in the show notes at mineralrightspodcast.com. Thanks again, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.